I'll be talking about building an asynchronous reactive NoSQL SDK uh, with Eric's Java. So a lot of buzzwords uh, here. <laughs> but the, my, my goal today is to give a bit of a, uh, an intro to Eric's Java. Who has never heard about Eric's, by the way? Okay, a few, uh, a few people, okay. So give a little bit of, a, of an intro and uh, show you how we, uh, we used it uh, in the new Couchbase uh, Java SDK and how, how we uh, exposed it to the users and what the architecture of the new, this new SDK is and some feedback uh, about it. So my name is uh, Simon Ballet, uh, Simon Basel. Uh, I work as an SDK engineer on the Java Couchbase uh, SDK. And I want to begin with, um, with the story of a rewrite and a little bit of, of history on the, um, on the Couchbase SDK. So if we go back as early as 2003, um, the first ancestor of uh, sort of of uh, coach base was uh, memcached so the memcached project uh, which is still running pretty strong uh, was is um, an in me in memory uh, key value store so basically a, a cache right it's a distributed cache so it it really shines uh, when you want to stick arbitrary data uh, like binary and get it back very, very, very quickly. So the aim at the time was that you had database uh, servers and they couldn't cope with the load that was getting higher and higher from web applications. So you wanted to, uh, for, to cache uh, all objects that were asked for uh, really often and just pay the cost of getting their, them from memory and not from the, the database disks. So it's, it was a pretty uh, popular project. And um, by 2004, uh, there were many, many people, more and more people uh, contributing. It's an open source project. And a lot of the main contributors are actually at Couch, working at Couchbase uh, now. But it was missing some, some key um, thing, which is persistence. So fast forward 2009, where the Membase um, project started. And Membase was aiming at, it's still cache key value oriented, but um, it aimed at adding some features to uh, Memcached. So it can be used as a drop-in replacement for Memcached, it has the same APIs. But then it's uh, replicating data uh, around nodes and it's persistent, it, has, it adds persistency to, to disk. And a few, year, a few years later, um, this membase was um, kind of merged with another NoSQL database, um, CouchDB, which is a, a document-oriented, JSON document-oriented uh, NoSQL database, and they formed CouchBase. So yeah, uh, it was a Couchbase is an hybrid between a, a key value store, in memory store, and a document oriented uh, database. So it it means that the program the programming model for the SDK has to has to evolve as well. And um, almost two years ago, we stopped at uh, Couchbase and we looked at how things were, and we saw that. Uh, we used, uh, we built our SDK on top of um, um, a memcached uh, client, spy memcached, and so we have a lot of legacy. And we said, okay, this is getting more and more difficult to uh, evolve the the client, right? And we see more and more inconsistencies in the API. So we want, we are on the lookout for a new an opportunity to, to do some rewrite of our client. SpyMemcached, by the way, was one of the first uh, clients for Memcached on the, on the GVM. So 
you can imagine that it had a lot, a uh, lot of uh, maturity, but uh, also a lot of uh, history, legacy, if you, if you will. We are still maintaining it, but it's memcached only. No, you cannot access cache base with, with it. When I say API inconsistencies, I can give you a quick example. So, um, in the API, we have the get method and then an async get method. So the async get method, instead of blocking and only returning once the result is available, it will uh, return the future, right? And then there is, uh, as, a, as a developer, I say, okay, I, I learned about get, I learned about async get, I learned about futures maybe, so this is interesting. Uh, let's move on to uh, inserting some data in the, in the cache or the database. So, okay, see, this is the set operator, right? And if I apply what I've learned before, then uh, obviously the uh, async, asynchronous version of it would be async get, right? Wrong. Set in the API at the time was already, um, already asynchronous, so already returning a future. So this is the kind of, uh, of inconsistencies and surprises uh, that can arise for developers as they learn about the API, learn about the, the SDK. And we wanted to work on that and um, improve the experience. So and also, uh, we, had sev we have several SDKs, right, for many languages like uh, PHP, Python, .NET, Java, of course, C. And each SDK added its own uh, history and its own uh, API. So differences in, in usage. So we, we said, okay, uh, maybe it's a good, uh, a good idea to, um, to work on, a, on a, a similar API for all the SDKs and make sure that this is, this is consistent across the board. So that's what, what we did with the second generation of, of clients. And in the Java SDK, my, my colleague Michael uh, was at the time seeking, uh, thinking about, yeah, we, we'd like a better model for doing asynchronous programming. So uh, users are displaying more and more advanced usage where they want to compose uh, processing streams asynchronously. And futures, they just don't cut it. They are not a good fit for this, this job. So we looked at several alternatives, but we, uh, uh, we had a speci special interest in Eric's job um, because this was a new paradigm, a, a good paradigm um, that came from the .NET ecosystem, actually. And it has a growing community. It had uh, no dependencies. We wanted to uh, keep dependencies of the SDK as small as possible. Uh, it's mature in production at, uh, at Netflix. And uh, so we started using it in, in the core layer of, uh, I will talk about that later. And then we said, well, this, this works quite well, so why not expose it to the users? So that's, that's what we did then. It was a good, uh, a good occasion for a, a rewrite of the, of the SDK. So second generation of, of SDK. Um, I'll talk about, uh, I'll dive a little bit into Rx Java, so Rx Java 101. Uh, this is the logo for uh, Rx. So the idea is that, uh, let look, let's look at uh, how you use your, your data. When you have single uh, items of data and you want to do synchronous processing of it, then it's just the return type of uh, method, the return type T, right? What are your options when you have multiple data but you still process it synchronously? Well, usually what, what you'll do is uh, use a collection, an iterable of T. And then when you start playing with asynchronous, when you, um, you start uh, seeing that it gives you better, uh, more efficient uh, resource processing, and you deal only with single values, then you can start using futures of t, returning futures of t. 
but this is limited to single values and this is not very composable, even though um, in Java 8 uh, you have composable future, um, well, you have a new form of future that is better at it, but still single value. And then that's where Rx Java comes in, at the sweet spot uh, between multiple data and asynchronous uh, processing. So Rx Java deals with observable of T. An observable is like an asynchronous stream. And if I want to make a comparison with um, uh, the synchronous way of doing it, the collections, it's kind of the duality of uh, iterable iterator, you know. So uh, what you get here is a stream into which, uh, on which you subscribe, and you get notified of new items coming in in the stream. So this this is more of a, a, a push model, whereas with collections it's a pull model. As the developer, you decide when you want the next bit of the next item of, of data. Here in Rx, with observable, you are notified. Let's push push the comparison a little bit. So you have three kind of events that you can deal with. You have data retrieval, so in a collection that, in an iterator that would be a next, calling next. So once again, you, you pull the data, you are actively calling the next operator. Discovering errors in the iterator model, it's, froze, it's just frozen an exception, right? And it returns, it stops iterating when, when the collection is, uh, has been covered. So in, a, uh, in Rx, um, with the observable model, you, you, have a sub, um, you subscribe to the stream. And when you subscribe, you describe your consuming uh, process, your consumer, uh, as the observer interface. And the observer interface is very simple. It has one, two, three methods, right? So the first one on next um, will be called it's the notification of each new item in the stream. What do you do with, uh, with a new item? On error, you will get notifications of uh, exceptions. And um, this is a terminal event. So if there is an error, the stream stops. Or it either stops if there is uh, an error or if you reached the end of the stream. So you get a notification for that as well. But notice that this, um, this applies well to multiple data in, a, in an asynchronous mode, but it's also, it's, it also works um, with single values, just emit on next once and then uncompleted. And it could also work with infinite streams, like uh, user input, mouse clicks, mouse moves, uh, time-related data, so generate an event every second, on next, on next, on next, but never complete. And this works as well. Another thing with Rx Java is that it, it has a lot of operators. And it really shines uh, once you have started uh, recognizing these operators, what they do, getting to know them. It really shines in readability and also in uh, composition. So basically in Rx Java, everything you do, you do by chaining operators that will mu mutate mutate the, um, the stream. And uh, you build up an asynchronous uh, pipeline uh, processing. I will show you uh, a few operators for, for Rx and talk about them. So. What kind of things can you can you do? Well, the first thing you you do usually is you want to to transform your your data along the way. Uh, who has done some functional programming in the assistance? Okay, so you must recognize this uh, operator. This is one of the basics, right? So map map text uh, map function as a parameter, and this map function is just a transformation. So 
you have, um, so, by the way, this is a marble diagram. This is part of uh, Eric's documentation. So it's kind of a nice way to, to show, uh, to display what the operators do. So here what you have is uh, an observable, the, the arrow, the timeline, if you will, which gets notifications in the form of marbles or circles and uh, uncompleted event. The, the line here means end of the string. And when you call map on this observable, you obtain, it wraps, and you obtain a new observable, target observable, uh, that has different data. So basically here, each time a new uh, item is emitted in the source, it goes through the map function. So it transforms a uh, marble into uh, a diamond. And it, this value gets emitted right away. So you, 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 see the, you see the point here. Then there is another one called uh, flat map. Flat map is also a transformation, except that um, the transformation, the return type of the map function, is actually an observable itself. So it could be, for example, um, an asynchronous request for each item in the source, which may be, for instance, uh, a key. Uh, then uh, go on a server and do a HTTP request. And once the result get back, all the results, they get merged into the target, uh, the outcome uh, observable. So here, I, uh, in the, this image, you see that this is a small observable with two emissions for each source item. And you also see something is that um, the, the output items that correspond to the red, uh, red or the, the yellow um, source item, they get interleaved with the blue ones because they get merged, they get flattened as they, as they come, right? So each time uh, a new item for the source, uh, the target observable comes in, it, it gets emitted. But as I said, uh, it's not, it, it works well with single items as well. So here you, you could have only one, uh, one item, one, one request, for example. That's what we do in the, in the Couchbase SDK. And then, OK, merge is interesting because it allows you to take two source observables and uh, merge them together. And this is actually what, uh, what the flat map does. Flat map is nothing more than a map and a merge combined. So same principle. They get in, uh, interleaved in the, in the output. And notice that here we have an error in the first source observable. And this error gets propagated directly. So this blue item here never gets emitted. That's only three basic uh, operators. But you get a lot more like um, you get filtering uh, with predicates. You get um, operators to only take the first n items. In, sorry, n items in the stream. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities. For example, instead of merge, you can use concat, which will emit first all the items in uh, in observable A, then all the items in observable B. A lot of a lot of options. And then you start um, seeing interesting operators, advanced operators. So like retry. Before I get into details on, on retry, uh, let me tell you about uh, one of the uh, ideas of Eric, which is the hot, hot versus cold observable. So the, the idea is that. Um, Cold observables, they will start a new stream of emissions, a new for each um, new subscriber. So if you subscribe to do some processing, it's if you subscribe to, to your stream twice, and your stream does some asynchronous HTTP requests, as I was saying, then you will send two, two requests 
to the, to the server. The idea is that with a cold observable, um, if you don't subscribe, nothing happens. You've just described your, your pipeline of processing, but it won't execute, nof it won't execute anything until you subscribe for the first time. On the, other, on the other end, you have hot observables. And hot observables, they don't care uh, if uh, someone subscribed or not. So they, they just go, OK, I, I start emitting right away. A good example would be um, timers. So if you want to emit one value every, every second, you can do, uh, use the interval factory method. And if you don't subscribe, it still emits item. And if you subscribe multiple times, uh, describe different consuming behaviors, then it, each consumer will see the same uh, items from the point where he started his, his uh, subscription. This is important, this concept for, for retry, because here we see that retry does actually several subscriptions. So the idea is that very simply by just chaining this operator in your stream, um, it will detect if there is an error. So an error gets call, called in the source observable, right? And what it will do is uh, resubscribe right away and let it try again. And this time you see that it could come through and emit the, the results uh, in, the, in the target observable, in the output observable. But it's, it's, uh, it can get a little bit more intelligent, like conditional retries. Um, you, can do, you can check the type of exception that you, you got and retry accordingly. Uh, you can pass in the number of time, maximum number of attempts that you want to make. So retry, retry four times, and if after four times it still doesn't work, just propagate the error. And when you combine it with um, error handling operators, like on error resume next, it gets very powerful. So on error resume next, the idea is that you have a fallback operator, um, observable. And in case of error, it will switch to this observable. And it could be something dynamic. So for, ex for instance, keeping with the HTTP request, um, REST URL request, or whatever example, if you have one uh, service external service that is unreli unreliable, crashes all the time. And then you have um, a second service that you pay for on each call, but at least it's reliable. What you can do is use on error resume next and say, only if in case of error on the free service, will I switch back to uh, the paid service, this kind of thing. And combined with retry, with advanced retry operators, you can get some things like um, exponential backoff. So exponential backoff is basically saying, okay, retry, but give time uh, to the to the server, to the target of your request or whatever, give it time to recover. So you will uh, retry with a delay, and a delay that grows exponentially between each call, and you get some patterns in Rx Java to to do just that. And actually, in the Couchbase SDK, we expose a, a builder to help you uh, build such patterns. So OK, th this is like just uh, touching the surface of, of the API. I won't go more into detail, uh, detailing any more uh, other operators, because you can read the documentation online, or you can uh, go to workshops like the one I do uh, on uh, Thursday. But uh, you get a lot, a lot of choice of operators. And then when you learn to use them correctly, you get a lot of patterns, uh, interesting patterns, like the uh, exponential backoff I, I was talking about. So yeah, we decided to use Rx Java as the async API for, um, for the Couchbase SDK. So how did we approach things? First, um, First, we started using it as the async layer, the internal layer of the SDK. But then it occurs, occurred to us, well, um, the, um, 
this works well for, for users uh, as well. Uh, so the sync API could just be a facade on top of the async API, and we would provide an async API based on Rx Java. So the idea here is that maybe first we want to expose a sync API because developers are, are not all familiar with async processing and don't want maybe want to um, learn Rx uh, right away. So give them time, expose the sync API by default, and then um, expose also an async API on um, virtually on top of it, but actually it's the other way around. So what, what happens when you do a get, uh, a synchronous get in the, um, in the SDK? So you prov provide an ID, you provide a timeout duration and a time unit. And what it does is internally it switches back to the asynchro asynchronous API, calls a get which returns an observable of, uh, of this JSON document type, calls the get with the, the key of the document, mm -hmm. And then here comes the, the power of Rx. For example, here you have in Rx you can chain a timeout uh, operator, uh, give it the timeout duration and the time unit, and it will uh, fail if the whole operation, the whole stream, doesn't complete before this timeout. So if you think about it, this kind of chaining of, of composability, instead of having the timeout right here in, into the, uh, the API, as a parameter, it's it's more powerful because you can do a global timeout on the whole the whole rec rec request, and with composability, you can imagine doing also small time out, times out for individual requests. Let's say you want to do bulk a bulk get, um, so it will go through a collection of of keys, flat map into um, a, a get call like this, retrieve the document, retrieve each document corresponding to each key, and each of these requests could have its own little timeout. I don't expect a get to take more than one second, maybe, or actually with Scotchbase, uh, less than that. Let's say two milliseconds. Uh, and then for the whole uh, batch get, bulk get, you could chain uh, uh, another timeout um, and apply it globally to the whole request, so uh, don't block for mon more than uh, 10 seconds. When, if, when you think about it, it's pretty hard to do uh, with uh, blocking behavior or futures and stuff like that. And then, getting back to our uh, facade for, for uh, synchronous API, then what you do uh, with an observable to switch back to a synchronous um, behavior is called two blocking. This give, gives you a blocking observable. And then on that, you can retrieve the actual value, wait for it, and block for it with single uh, operator. Single or default is just saying, OK, I'll wait for one. I'll expect one item to be emitted, and then the stream to complete. I'll wait for it. But if it completes empty, then I'll just return null instead of of uh, erroring or, or something. So yeah, this this way of uh, of working is that we have a core that is fully asynchronous, fully um, Rx based, message based, if you will, and we build the synchronous API on top of it, and then we also expose it so that the user can use uh, the power of Rx Java himself. For instance, here is uh, bucket is, uh, let's say it's the asynchronous uh, API. We have a, a query. So in Couchbase, we have the concept of uh, views, which are map reduce uh, functions that index your data as a sec secondary indexed in instead of just using key values. And here we have an example of a view query in the uh, new uh, Java SDK. So this is from the Couchbase API. So we, we say that we start a query uh, from the design, the, the view uh, beers by name. And we want to limit to the first 100 items. So this is what gets sent to the, to the server. 
and the server will uh, respond with uh, 100 items, and it will stream these items to us uh, in a in a binary response uh, in the in the protocol. So what we do is that from that we have at this point we have an observable of an async view result. And what we want to do is okay for the one result that we'll get we will get asynchronously, we will flat map on it and call the rows method, which is another stream, another observable, this time of rows. The results uh, of the of the query, then we'll flat map again to uh, go in at the perpendicular, go in uh, back to the the database and retrieve the actual document. So the rows will give you give us at, at first it will give us keys that match the query, and then you, we we go to the database and fetch the content of the of the document for for each row, and remember that it all gets flattened into a single observable. So here we don't have an observable of observable of uh, rows. We, we got just an observable of rows. Same here, an observable of document. So that this has allows us to continue using Rx Java to say, OK, what I want is also filter. So I'll get a, a stream of documents that, uh, that are returned by, uh, by my query. I want to filter them on their content. Does the content, which is JSON, contains a field named ABV, a double field get, get ABV, and is it uh, greater than five? If so, keep this particular document. Otherwise, just throw it. We still have a, an observable of, of JSON document. So what we do maybe is count the number of filtered bills. So, is it what? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, the, the content, uh, the, the, there's no null content. So, yeah, but... No, it's, that, that's, that's from the SDK. Yeah. So, if, what happens if there is a null pointer at this, at this point? Uh, it will get propagated. Uh, Rx Java will catch it, and oh no! Uh, what I meant is uh, inspect the content uh, and check if the value, the attribute ABV, is greater than five. Okay, so you're right. I don't I don't test for null or anything, but Rx Java will catch that. Yeah. And, and then what we wanted to do basically is just filter these documents and count the number of, uh, of matching bills uh, instead of returning the, the name of the bill or anything. But it could, be, it could be something else. And then we say, OK, I don't expect this to take more than 10 seconds. If it takes more than 10 seconds, timeout. And the timeout will get notified um, on the on error method of your consumer. And this is the part where I say, OK, I subscribe to this stream. So up until now, uh, nothing happened. You just described your, your processing. And then you subscribe, and you say, this is a shortcut to, s to only describe on next method. So you say, on each new item that comes to me, just print it. This is, this is Java 8 syntax. So maybe some people are not familiar with lambdas. Um, this is. Syntactic sugar uh, around the uh, anonymous class. Basically, you can you can think of it that way. So uh, this is an anon kind of an anonymous class which says, as I have a, a single doc as input and I return doc content. Uh, this the result of this test. And this is um, references to static methods in the async view row cl uh, class. Yeah. So here we say, OK, we subscribe on this stream. And as long as it doesn't take more than 10 seconds, I will print every result of the streams, which is just a count, actually. So yeah. 
this is the kind of uh, of things you you can you can build with the API. And actually, if you look at it, only this is part of the SDK query, and then it's just flat map, filter, count, timeout. All that is from from Everex Java. So as you learn more and more about Rx, as you get more and more familiar, you will always be able to uh, compose um, more advanced uh, streams and do uh, advanced things with, uh, with your data. OK, uh, I was talking about, uh, so this is kind of uh, the presentation of, of Eric's Java, but I was also talking about um, this re-architecture around Eric, and I want to uh, dive a little bit into what we've done with the, the SDK and the kind of architecture that we put into place so that you can have asynchronous processing from end to end if you, if you want. So basically, uh, the idea is that we started uh, separating the uh, the client into two layers the core layer the core layer here and the java client uh, the rest is just um, what could come next but for now we have the core and the java and a bit of uh, of spring integration so the idea is that uh, the core is fully uh, asynchronous built on message uh, passing with Rx Java, and uh, it relies on uh, Netty for uh, network I/O and uh, data structure, with, which is called a ring buffer for um, batching uh, uh, requests. So, for each operation, there is a request that comes into the, the core. Uh, it gets processed asynchronously and uh, the response is injected it into an observable that is passed uh, to the, the client. I'll get into details uh, about that right away. And then on top of that, we have a layer, the Java client layer, uh, which exposes all the actual APIs uh, I was talking about, so get, set, etc. the consistent API, which are the same uh, in all our SDK, minus um, idiomatic things to your language. So. Of course, in uh, Ruby, you won't get uh, types, and it will uh, take advantage of the possibilities of, of each langu language. But the method names globally are, are the same. No surprises. And then we want to uh, more and more support uh, frameworks in the community, so Spring, Play, Rails are possibilities. But actually, this, this kind of architecture, th this should be great. This kind of architecture allows us to build bricks uh, on top of the, the core layer, which has all the low level, like binary protocol encoding, decoding of frames, stuff like that, to work with Scotchbase. But the higher level things can be built on top of it. Right? So one thing that comes often is a Scala, uh, a Scala client. And we don't have a timeline for that, but we, we would like to implement this kind of thing. Thanks. OK, so here is a, a schema of how the, the core works. So you have um, a facet exposed to the, the client, the Java client, which takes uh, request messages, catch based request messages. And each message. Uh, is published into a ring buffer. So the, who knows the, about the LMAX disruptor, maybe? OK, so this is a very efficient uh, data structure uh, for kind of queuing uh, data. And it's log-free, so uh, it means that it scales uh, very, very efficiently. So the, uh, this, uh, the idea is that each request will be uh, queued into such a ring buffer. And then Netty uh, has a request handler that will, we, we wrote a Netty handler, which is a request handler, which it will look into the, the buffer and extract the next uh, request to process. 
And we see here that it goes two ways. Each time you call the, the core, each time you send the new messages, it publishes the request into the ring buffer, but as well, it returns immediately an observable. So the client gets hold of an observable and can, can chain around it, compose around it, and then subscribe to it. But this is, this is a hot observable. So uh, if, it, if the client doesn't subscribe, it, still will, it will still uh, fire the, the request, right? So this is where asynchronicity comes in. You, you get a result immediately. It doesn't, it doesn't block, of course. You get an observable, and we'll inject values in, into this observable at a later point in time when the server will have answered our, our query. So life cycle of a query. So the request handler will um, check the, the request, check the key, and it will be able, because it knows the topology of the Couchbase cluster uh, via hashing mechanisms and such, it will be able to determine which node to talk to. It will go down to a service level. Is it a key value query? Is it a view query or something else? And this gives us the endpoint, so IP and port, to talk to directly with a binary po protocol, which is very efficient. But it's not REST or something fancy and easy like that. So this is where Netty shines in that it allows you to uh, write uh, encoder decoders uh, very easily. So Netty will uh, transcode this request into a, a binary memcached binary protocol message, and it will write it into a channel uh, that will send it to the server. And same here. So it sends to the server. The server responds with a binary response, which gets decoded and published into um, the response ring buffer, another, that, uh, another queue, if you will. Here we have a response handler, which just takes uh, decoded responses and says, OK, uh, I know the observable that we returned earlier. Uh, that should um, receive this response. So I'll inject the response into the observable. And this is where it goes, uh, the call completes, and it goes back to the client. And if there are any errors, uh, exa for example, the server says key doesn't exist, then this will get transcoded into uh, another kind of response. And it, this will call the on error method of, of uh, the original observable. A little bit about Netty. So uh, Netty, I think, is the best uh, NIO uh, library out there. So even not on the, the JVM. It's really, really performant, uh, awesome to work with. So it allows you to encode, decode in a very uh, straightforward way. So you construct pipelines of encoder and, deco and decoders, and Netty takes all the, the work of writing it asynchronously to the wire, um, reading responses without blocking, and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, you, you compose uh, pipelines, uh, and you can create handlers that are protocol specific. So if you want to do, um, here I constructed a, a pipeline to say, OK, uh, this will be binary memcache messages. So I have a codec to encode and decode that. And since um, the server can uh, send responses in a chunked mode, so several packets, several uh, bursts of responses, uh, I have an aggregator to wait for the complete response to come in before further processing. Oop. Sorry about that. And it, actually, I, I read it backwards. OK, so um, this is the last handler that gets get called. But here's the ID. Um, here you can have, on top of that, um, authentic authentication handling. And then you have uh, the processing of the, the actual responses uh, as well. So 
the interesting thing is that, for example, authenticating, you only need to do it once, right? So Netty allows you to um, to retire yourself from the pipeline. So in the case of the this handler here, key value authentication handler, um, first time, first uh, request that go out, it will actually uh, do all the dance with the server to say, okay, I'm authenticated. And then when, once it's, it's done, uh, it, it uh, leaves the pipeline and you never have to deal and to pay the cost of authentication again because it's basic uh, HTTP in the, in the headers of the request, basic HTTP authentication, for example. Um, so that's that's an example of what you can uh, you can do uh, a broad overview of of what Netty can can do. And having composed all these uh, libraries uh, allowed us to to have uh, a core that is fully asynchronous, no blocking anywhere, and uh, which is really easy to to evolve. And which exposes interesting paradigms for for doing async to the client uh, as well. So it's win-win. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, lessons that we learned along the way. Uh, so I, as I was saying, there is a huge benefit in exposing uh, an, async, an async API um, with with Eric's Java uh, at least because. It gives you so many possibilities uh, that not exposing them, not giving it to the users would be a shame, right? Uh, but of course, there is a learning curve. So you have to uh, dig a little bit deeper into Rx uh, to, use, uh, to use that. You have to read a bit, uh, a bit about it. We try to uh, provide documentation on, in the Couchbase documentation for migration and learning the concepts, the core concepts, but you have to to dig a little bit on, on your own. And uh, as, uh, as I said, yeah, it's important to expose a sync API first and foremost. So um, initially in the first iteration, the first beta of, uh, of the project, uh, we exposed, by default, we exposed the asynchronous API uh, and then we said, okay, to do a blocking call, you have to call to blocking uh, dot single, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was uh, it was a mistake. Um, synchronous is easier to get your your to wrap your head around. So of course you should expose synchronous first, and then give the opportunity to um, upgrade to an asynchronous API, which we did in the SDK by. Um, providing on each um, entry point to the API, we provide an async method, which gives you the same API, but asynchronous with observable instead of uh, type T, JSON document, or double, or whatever. Another thing is um, consistency matters. Consistency of the API met matters. Um, we had uh, way too much users uh, scratching their heads and saying, okay, um, I, I don't understand why it's done that way. One time you deal with futures, one time you don't deal with futures, you have to explicitly call uh, async get or stuff like that. So this was becoming a growing uh, pain for, for users. And if the users uh, are not happy, then they will just Leave, uh, stop using your product, and we can't uh, we can't allow that. <laughs> so yeah, consistency matters, and we've done a, we've done a huge uh, job uh, in improving it. And I think um, an interesting thing about Rx Java is that it's also getting more and more uh, ported to various languages. So you get Rx JS JavaScript, um, Rx Python, as I was as I was saying, it's originally from the .NET world, and in each of these languages, you get the same, pretty much the same API, the same operators you are familiar with, so the same paradigms. So you can go from one to the other very easily. And nowadays, 
a lot of projects are uh, multi languages, right? So this is for this kind of project at least. This is very interesting to um, to have the same model overall and not uh, having to um, re relearn something. So you can apply these paradigms in many languages. And we try to do the same with the SDKs uh, at Coachbase. So no surprises when you switch from uh, the Java SDK to the .NET SDK or the Python SDK. At least the key value uh, API is always the same. Yeah. You'll get um, get operation, upsert, insert, create, all these are always this, uh, always uh, named the same, which was not the case previously. So, um, Asynchronous is more resource efficient. Uh, there was a talk uh, this afternoon about uh, the need for uh, asynchronous, which was pretty interesting, going deep into the, uh, into the layers of, uh, of uh, computer ar architectures. Um, asynchronous is more resource efficient and scales better because you don't spend uh, CPU cycles just blocking, waiting for a response. All these cycles you can spend um, starting processing other requests and so on and so forth. So I think is uh, is pretty important. Um, but you should try to use mechanisms like explicit back pressure to avoid overloading your system. So if you can scale up and a process a lot, a huge, a ton of, uh, of requests, but your database uh, or other systems you, you query are not able to keep up with this kind of load, what happens? Well, uh, in without this back pressure mechanism that I will talk about a little bit, um, you just pile up other requests. And once the system downstream starts uh, having hiccups, you don't care. You still you have you still have users, tons of users doing tons of requests. So you forward the request to your uh, downstream uh, system, and after a while, the system will just crash. Right? It won't keep up with with the load and and crash. And in turn, probably your system will crash as well because it relies on this database or external API or something. So explicit back pressure is a way of saying, okay. Um, you are asking way too much of me. Uh, I'm not. I'm only able to process like 1,000 requests per second, and you ask me for 10,000. You send me 10,000 requests per second. So slow down a little bit, okay? So it's a way of propagating upstream that you are overloaded, and you did. You need maybe a little bit of time to recover. So maybe this request could be sent uh, with a 10 millisecond delay, and this will give you time to recover a little bit and start processing um, requests at, at peak again. And you get things like that in the in the Couchbase SDK. Well, you have uh, mechanisms as well in in Rx Java to do that. W what I just told, uh, inform upstream how many requests you can process. And what we do in the Couchbase SDK is basically. Um, throw an exception when too much uh, requests come in, and you can decide what to do. Uh, should I shed load? So forget about this request. Should I put them in a queue? Maybe retry later. Yeah. That's, that's true, yeah. If Most of the time, if you receive an on error notification, this is a in Rx Java, this is a terminal event, so it's it blocks further processing. But you get also mechanisms to recover from that, like on error, uh, resume next. There are all uh, all sorts of operators, so you can you could do things to uh, recover from that, and you should. Okay, um, Netty plus the ring buffer. It amortizes slow consumers, so we get something called the batching effect. Um, if your server cannot keep up with the, the load, the fact that you um, queue the requests in the ring buffer and then Netty consumes them uh, at its own pace uh, means that you won't get uh, problems with, with um, 
a slow server, less problems. Uh, this is linked to back pressure as well. And uh, the batching effect is basically, uh, it will naturally batch your queries uh, into a single TCP stream uh, if they all come together at, at, a, at a quick pace instead of creating one stream for, for each query even, even if they come in really quickly. Uh, one other thing that we tried to that we saw and we tried to improve is um, dependency clashes. So we had a lot of these, like um, Netty or Logback or stuff like that, uh, uh, clashes when uh, when our users were on the old generation of the client. So we what we did is we bundled them into the a fat jar. Uh, so we rewrote the namespaces of, of these de dependencies and incorporated them into uh, the jar of the, the SDK so that externally the, the SDK has only one dependency, it's Rx Java, so that we, you, you can choose uh, which version you, you use, even, even if we recommend one, the latest. Um, so yeah, this, this solves uh, a lot of problems with um, with this kind of of uh, dependency clashes, but it comes with a is a with a cost. First, you have to do that uh, processing when creating bundling the the jar. You have to probably rewrite the documentation as well automatically to uh, replace old packages with new packages, so that uh, when your users uh, in their IDE get your fat jar, uh, they also get the documentation for Netty or and so forth. And if your users actually use uh, Netty as well, and then they cannot do things like putting resources in common, thread pools and stuff like that, because the namespace had to be changed. So they won't be the same, and the Java virtual machine will think this is two different classes, right? So this is a little bit of a, of a trade-off. Um, Rx Java is great with uh, notably with things like retry, error handling, multiple data handling, bulk gets and stuff like that. Uh, we get in the SDK before we only have we, we only had one uh, bulk operation which was get, but now we do that entirely by relying on Rx Java operators with uh, observable from flat maps and stuff like that. So we get. Um, bulk sets, bulk inserts for free, for example. And this is great. But uh, you should probably, if you start implementing, actually op implementing observables, you should uh, probably, and we should have probably uh, started with cold observables instead of hot observables, as I was saying uh, earlier, to get the least surprises. Because with things like retry, where there is a, a resubscription, you get some surprises with hot observable. So this is something we are working on um, because using Netty, we, are, we have pulled resources like byte buffers and stuff like that uh, that must be released. And it's becoming harder and harder to do uh, with hot observables. So we are reworking this uh, internals of, of the SDK. And almost on time, that's, that's it for me. Um, and if you have questions, don't hesitate. Thank you.